Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start us off. My name is Jen, uh, and I obviously work with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, which is um, a member-based national organization that works on research and advocacy at the intersection of human health and planetary health. Um, and I want to start uh, this webinar with an acknowledgement. Um, I'm living right now in Toronto on the unceded traditional Indigenous territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Um, and I think it's especially important um, in times like this, in times of crisis, um, that we're, we think about the ways that crises don't impact everybody equally. Um, and some of the challenges related to COVID, like um, access to healthcare and limitations on gathering and climate change um, impact Indigenous communities in Canada disproportionately and differently than um, settler populations. And so as we do this work, as we think about our response to COVID and to climate change, it's important to keep the first peoples of this land front of mind. Um, and ways to do that are Indigenous Climate Action has a Facebook page where they're linking frequently. They're talking about COVID and climate change um, and its impact on Indigenous communities. Um, and Raven Trust is also doing some work um, around education and webinars, um, particularly in related to fracking. So I'd encourage you to check those out. Um, on the call today, we have Courtney Howard, who's an emergency room physician in the Northwest Territories. Um, we'll have Melissa Lem, um, and, who's a family doctor in Vancouver. We've also got Yasin Cholokov, who's a public health resident um, working in Quebec. Um, and Yasin's been working on COVID since July. And then finally, we've got Robin Edger, who's Cape CD. And I'm going to flip for a moment to Robin uh, to give us a little bit more background uh, about Cape before we dive in. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so I'm Rob Edger. I'm the Executive Director here at the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, or CAPE. Uh, here at CAPE, we're a research, education, and advocacy organization, and our focus is on the intersection of planetary health and human health. Um, so we're a national organization, we're member-based, and we rely on a network of very active volunteers from all across the country. Uh, and we're blessed to have a number of physician, uh, you know, phenomenal climate communicators, uh, some of whom you're going to hear from today. And our main focus is to support their ability to advocate uh, to create change. And we know how effective health framing can be in creating change. Uh, poll after poll shows that the best way to uh, firm up the sort of soft support of climate action is to educate people on the, uh, the risk to their health and the health of their loved ones that climate change brings. So we do have an ask of you. Uh, please, when the webinar is done, please go to our website at cape.ca and become a member. Uh, anyone can become a member. You don't need to be a physician. Uh, there's no minimum donation amount. And uh, secondly, if you're working on climate issues, and I know many of you are, uh, reach out to us. We, we love to collaborate. Uh, we love to bring the health code benefits uh, to your work. We love it if you can bring the subject matter expertise uh, to help us with ours. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We hope to hear from many of you soon. And uh, shameless cake plug over. I'll turn it back to you, Jen. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Um, I, I also understand there's a problem in the chat. I am managing two things, and so I will, I will get on it in about 30 seconds. Um, my apologies. Um, so uh, we're now three weeks into social distancing, um, and the, the society and this is our society and the spaces we live in have changed dramatically in the last three weeks. Um, I think it's been remarkable to watch the, the ways people have changed their lives to care for other people. If Canadian curves are flattening, and I've seen some charts recently, I don't want to, I don't want to like say this is what's happening, but it looks like in some cases it's possible that our curve is coming in um, under some, some other countries which makes me hopeful for our healthcare system. Um, and if that's the case, I'm not saying it is, but if that's the case, it's only happening because of the beautiful ways that people have stepped up to care for each other in the last weeks. Staying home in solidarity with their neighbors and with health workers, getting groceries for neighbors, offering resources, building community care work networks, um, and running campaigns and calling for supports to allow people to stay home. Um, 
And all of that has been incredibly important um, in protecting and saving lives. At the same time, we're still facing challenges around um, climate health. Um, we've seen a, in countries around the world um, that um, some governments are using this as an opportunity to roll back environmental um, protections. Um, we've seen the fossil fuel uh, industry lobby um, for money and bailouts. And so it's this really challenging time of balancing the current crisis, uh, health crisis that we're facing and not wanting to create further crises in the future, which is something Courtney has said very eloquently. Um, and so that's, that's part of the conversation we're continuing to have and what we're hoping to discuss today. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to flip to, to Yasin and then, uh, and we'll go from there. Hi everyone. So I'll just summarize things that have been going on in the last few weeks. I'm sure many of you know it. Coronavirus is a novel virus that we discovered first in, uh, in, uh, China in the city of Wuhan. Uh, and it's been kind of spreading around the world with, uh, recently a, a million cases all over the globe. Um, the issue now you've heard flattening the curve many, many times over. <clears throat> you've probably heard why we're doing it. It's not so much because this is a disease that we, we, we treat very differently from other diseases that we know many types of virus it can cause. Very similar symptoms to the coronavirus. The issue is no one is immune since it's a new virus that comes into contact with humans. And if a lot of people get sick at once, our healthcare systems and have the capacity to care for all of them at once. The objective of flattening of the curve is basically spreading those people who get seriously sick over a longer period so that we can we can we can save their lives by providing the quality care that all Canadians deserve and that we have built our system to be able to. Um, for that purpose, there there there's certainly a lot of interventions that are happening in the health system things like elective things getting to create more space to care for those people with disease but it's the, the interventions that will have the, the greatest impact on slowing the transmission those ones are the one outside the health system so that's when we've seen things that now have happened just over two and a bit weeks ago so closing borders with other countries uh, lots of places moving to implement all kinds of distancing policies, physical distancing policies, which make us um, less likely to be in contact with someone who's sick and just slow down the progression of the disease. Because what um, you've probably all heard of the term R0, which is the reproductive factor of the disease, what, what makes the disease capable of spreading, that's fundamentally affected by, by the nature of the disease and the nature of how people interact with each other, and that's what we're trying to, to influence. That's the, the one thing that we have power of. Or if people interact with less other people, they have less chances of contracting the disease and less chances of spreading. Now, most uh, most estimates of what our interventions will do. Uh, someone says I'm cutting out. I'm gonna get closer. Hopefully, you'll hear me. Here. Most, uh, most, most of the interventions that we're trying to put in place uh, will, according to the models, and we don't have data, we're just doing this as we see. Uh, we're, we're hoping that they'll delay the peak uh, of when cases happen by about two to three-ish weeks. Uh, so that's not a lot. Uh, like in, in scenarios where we do nothing, peaks happen about four to six weeks after the disease starts to spread in a population. So adding a couple of extra weeks is a significant change, uh, but but one of the hopes also with with delaying the peak is that we're also decreasing the total amount of people who get sick as well. Uh, however, a direct effect of that is that things that we have to keep measures on for longer because people get sick slower, immunity in the population is slower, and the things that are in a way disrupting our standard lifestyle have to go on for longer. Um, so, so that's pretty much what, what currently in public health is going to do is that I think that importantly, how, um, like very important questions that we still don't have clear answers for, uh, with respect to, to what we're doing is when to stop the interventions. We have an idea, we'll follow the numbers of cases and so on and have an idea when things are getting better but it's still unclear how many people become immune without ever showing symptoms that we don't know about. We still don't know 
what will happen once we start reopening things and the disease can spread again. Uh, and, and that's gonna be, there, there's lots of progress on that. There's, we're gonna do new types of studies with lab tests that don't yet exist or, or are being developed right now and are not fully ready to roll out. Uh, but hopefully uh, that will give us an idea and probably what will end up happening is that we'll keep the measures that we currently have for a few months uh in, in total uh and, but that's a really stretchy guesstimate of, of what i'm saying um last thing this whole story i think that how this links to climate change and communication i think that many media and many people have pointed out that uh because of all the restrictions on travels on movement on work we've reduced many types of emissions i think that it's very however very tricky uh, and we probably should not get into celebrating any of those climate change uh, co-benefits, if we want to call them of COVID, because the main thing that we have to keep in mind is that those are things that people are not taking on voluntarily. I think through most of the climate change movements, we're trying to influence people's beliefs, trying to influence people's values in order for them to adopt a more healthy lifestyle, not, not trying to force them into what we want them to do. That's rarely an approach that works. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that people are currently having to deal with, with a sort of grief of the, the things that they can't do. People are not able to see loved ones. Uh, people are sometimes losing their livelihoods or having challenges in, in maintaining the lifestyle that they have. And people are also- Dawson, sorry, say something yeah. went really strange with your voice in that last second. Can you try the last two sentences one more time? Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, I'm saying that people, I think that the challenging, challenging situation is that COVID will cause people to, to, uh, to lose contact, to, to have a harder time being in contact with loved ones, to have a harder time uh, with their livelihoods, with keeping their lifestyle, keeping their house, keeping their, the place they're living in, providing food for their families, and people will also lose loved ones. People will see people that they know die because of the disease. It's not a large percentage, but a lot of people will end up having it and that's a challenging thing uh, and one of the reasons we have to be very careful when when thinking about how we communicate uh, the, um, the environmental impacts of coronavirus. I think some of the benefits that we'll see is that a lot of people for whom working in working virtually not traveling as much um, for whom that that was not something conceivable will now experience it firsthand and may like it and we may see <laughs> greater use of those modes of work in the future and systems might realize that that's a more resilient way of functioning and choose to favor those things in the future. And there might be benefits, but I think that that's something that we should look at a posteriori a year from now, let's say. Uh, and the last thing, kind of a general public health message, be, one has to be very careful at just looking at the numbers, comparing numbers from one place to another, looking at rises in numbers or stabilization numbers in coming to conclusions because things are changing all the time. Different jurisdictions test different people and you only see the numbers of, that, that, that of cases that are being declared. Different ways of testing change. For instance, here we're starting to, we're, we're now avoiding, we're reducing a lot the tests to general population to keep the tests that we have for healthcare workers and people who are in the hospital. So numbers will start rising at different rates doesn't mean that that the situation is changing there's the interpretation of what those numbers mean is uh, a lot more complex than than just looking at where it's going and uh that's it for me now thanks yasin um so we're gonna uh, hopefully try to have time for we're gonna have time for questions at the end so i'm seeing some questions in the chat and we'll pull those up and answer them um all at once at the end um but just maybe um take uh, take a moment uh, to share in the chat um, one thing that that you have been doing um, like during this sort of challenging time that's um, that's bringing you hope so if you're looking for the chat it's um at the bottom of your screen you should have an option to be able to to chat to everyone I think So we were seeing planting a garden, calling some friends. 
being politically active, growing food, connecting with people, um, seeing people be aware about this, a surge in collective thinking, connecting with more families and friends, um, and helping neighbors. Um, thanks. Because that's the other thing is like, there's a lot of collective wisdom in this space. So I wanted to hear a little bit from, from the, fo the folks on the call who aren't the panelists. Okay, um, we're gonna flip to Melissa Lem, who's in Vancouver, um, and who's definitely also got some thoughts about how, how we care for ourselves and our hearts in challenging times. Oh, Melissa, you're uh, muted. Hi, thanks. Thanks for um, introducing me, Jen. So I am, as you, as you mentioned, a family doctor in Vancouver, and I'm just going to talk a bit about what family doctors are seeing right now in Vancouver. So about two to three weeks ago, a couple weeks ago when we had our first webinar, it was like a bomb went off, right? We were seeing huge changes in our practice patterns as family doctors, we were scrambling to switch to more of a telemedicine based care delivery model. And there were a lot of changing guidelines around who should get tested for COVID-19 and where that should happen, along with a lot of fear about being on the front lines. And, you know, things have, overall things feel a little bit more settled, I would say, as, as settled as they can be, um, even though we all kind of feel like this is the calm before the storm. Um, I participated in a webinar last night with family doctors who work in different settings around BC, and our challenges are all quite different because of our diverse practices. So one doctor said she had a major lack of uh, personal protective equipment or PPE in her office, and another doctor who works on the downtown east side, where the, there are a lot of people, for those who don't know, um, um, who are experiencing homelessness and he's he's pretty scared about what's going to happen when COVID-19 hits his community. Um, in my office in particular we're, we're lucky to have a lot of PPE um, and we no longer do COVID-19 testing on site because we have resources in the city where we can do that but there's another interesting kind of pressure which is that we're seeing maybe one third or one half of the patients we normally do and this is also um, happening in ERs and specialist offices because patients are staying away like they should be doing so on top of worrying about our health, you know, to be kind of frank, not that I expect a lot of um, sympathy or, you know, for this, but we're also running into financial issues at this point, like we're um, like worrying about not being able to pay the rent or pay our staff. So on the on the positive side, though, I would say that doctors and healthcare workers are really stepping up and we're collaborating and we're innovating like crazy to get through this. Um, and even though I have a, a, an, an outpatient family practice here in Vancouver, I also do emergency work um, in rural settings. And uh, yesterday I wrote to Vancouver Coastal Health to ask if I could go through the rapid credentialing process so I can work in local hospitals if they need me. So I'm hoping that won't happen, um, but a lot, like a lot of my colleagues, I'm willing to go where I'm needed. And overall, I think the community appreciates that. Um, they're showing healthcare workers huge amounts of support. Every night I hear the uh, COVID 7 p.m. cheer here in Vancouver. Um, and so I think, I think overall doctors, family doctors feel, and others feel, pretty proud and grateful in many ways to be able to serve our communities in, in such an important way right now. So as a family doctor, I'm always looking for ways to improve my patient's health. And one aspect of health and the environment I'm really focusing on right now is the connection between nature and our health. So as we all know, right now, because of the need for physical distancing across Canada, Almost all the places, almost all the places where we go to socialize typically and, and to de-stress, like gyms and libraries and cafes are, are closed. So spending time outdoors in nature, which is open 24-7, is becoming one of the few options for people to spend recreational time outside their homes. And a lot of people are interpreting hashtag stay at home um, to mean that they have to literally stay at home all the time. But every medical officer of health who's commented on going outdoors so far has said that it's safe um, as long as we do respect physical distancing distancing guidelines. So I think it's a good and a positive message for us right now as a climate and a health movement um, to say that it's safe and healthy for us to get outside into nature as long as we physically distance and as a corollary important for us to protect and expand our green spaces so we can keep doing that. And I'm just going to put up a, a PowerPoint if I can. Um, hold on. So share screen, right? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, can you see my presentation there? Yep. Okay. It's very pretty. 
So thank you. So as you can see from these two infographics that I put up of many out there, there's a lot of research showing um, that the spending time in nature is one of the best things that you can do for your health. So a study last year actually calculated that around the world, um, the mental health care benefits um, to, to humans of spending time in protected green spaces totals about $6 trillion a US per year. And so three of the mental, three of the health benefits that I want to emphasize right now, um, some of which you can see in this infographic are, so number one, there are measurable improvements in cortisol or stress that are, that's particularly relevant right now because we're, you know, because we're in a really stressful and anxious time. So um, spending time in nature really improves your cortisol or stress hormone levels. And then number two, you can really get a boost in your immune um, function through stress reduction and also in some studies through directly uh, breathing in plant chemicals or phytoncides that directly improve your immunofunction and your um, immune, um, immunoprotein and immune cell function. And last um, but not least, there is some evidence showing improved lung health when you spend time in nature, um, which is important in COVID-19, obviously. So kids who live on streets with more trees have uh, lower rates of asthma and asthma exacerbations. So the next slide, it's, um, so I gave this talk at a, like a Nature Conservancy um, kind of nature talks uh, get together, I guess, in Vancouver and Toronto. And this slide speaks to why our brains and why our bodies are so happy in nature. So the first theory about why that is, it's called attention restoration theory. And basically urban environments, so either those outdoors in cities or the environments that we have inside our homes with screens and all these hard edges, they, our brains aren't used to them. So there's, basically they overstimulate us. So our brains get tired and they get irritable, but spending time in nature is sort of this um, source of soft fascination. So it's interesting, but it doesn't really require us to keep focusing our attention um, on it. And so that replenishes our powers of attention and uh, that basically rests our brains and makes us feel less irritable. And the second theory about why nature is so good for us and our brains, it's called stress reduction theory. And it, it kind of points to um, evolutionary theory. So essentially, if you think about it, nature has everything that we need to survive as, as humans. So it has water sources, it has lots of biodiversity where we can get food from, it has kind of heights where we can look out for predators. And so essentially brains evolved um, through, you know, we're thinking natural selection to prefer areas which had all those features, which means nature, because basically brains who liked that and felt less stressed in those environments would pass on their nature loving genes to future generations. So essentially our brains have evolved to want to be in nature. And so I just want to go through a few different studies about why, um, you know, some of the really compelling studies I think about why nature is important and also how much nature we need. So this is one study that looked at um, uh, tree data uh, using high resolution satellite imagery and it also uh, kind of combined it with Ontario health study data and self reports of health perception. So essentially 10 more trees on a block improved the participants health perception similar to an increase in their personal income of $10,000 per year um, or moving to a neighborhood with $10,000 per year higher median income or being seven years younger. So this is a really interesting way that you know relates age and, and income which we know is sort of one of the um, most important social social determinants of health with, um, with our health. And so I, I like this study because it kind of, it, it, see, it kind of makes nature into medicine. So this is a small pilot study. It was done in Chicago. And what they did was they, they guided 17 kids with ADHD on three 20 minute parks, um, two, three 20 minute walks through three different areas. So a city park and a downtown area and a residential area. And so for those of us who are kind of trying to uh, homeschool our kids at home, um, we might find this particularly useful as our kids are getting kind of rowdy. So what they found was that um, a 20 minute walk in the park improved their uh, math scores that we use to determine um, how kids are doing with ADHD or that we use to figure out um, attention to levels in kids without ADHD. And in fact, it rivaled the peak effects of Ritalin. So no one is saying that, you know, taking a walk in the park is going to replace medication um, when it comes to treating these symptoms. But I think I think we can sort of uh, keep that idea in mind when we're trying, especially with our kids, trying to keep them under control at home, take them outside for a walk. And so as a physician, I always think, you know, how much, like, what's the dose of nature that I need, you know, to treat my patients with? How much, how much time do they need outside and how much do they need per week? So in the last year, the evidence has come out um, giving us some guidelines. So this is uh, uh, an interesting study that came out last, last year. And so uh, it looked at 36 urban dwellers and 
over eight weeks and they asked them, the researchers asked them to have an outdoor nature experience in a place that brought them a sense of contact with nature for at least three weeks per, three times per week and for 10 minutes or more. And what they found was that compared to people who weren't spending that time in nature, um, their cortisol or stress, stress uh, hormone levels dropped about 21.3% more after a nature experience. And it, and you kind of got the biggest bang for your buck. You can kind of see that, um, that lowest sort of red line between 20 and 30 minutes. So if if you're trying to get outside, if you don't have a lot of time or, or you want to you know, stay inside as much as possible, if you can try to get outside some, into somewhere green for 20 to 30 minutes, you're going to see a, a real drop in your stress hormone levels. And then in terms of how much time we have to spend um, per week, so, this study showed that spending at least 20 minutes a week for this population in England um, increased their likelihood of reporting good health or high well-being significantly more when they hit uh, greater than or equal to uh, two hours per week. And they found that the positive associations peaked between 200 to 300 minutes per week. So if we can keep that in mind when we're heading outdoors, if we can try to get at least two hours per week, that, that should improve our well-being um, significantly. So I want to... I want to talk about why connecting to nature is also important for planetary health. And so basically research shows that people who are more connected to nature um, care about the environment more and makes them want to, more likely to want to protect it. And the UN Environment Program has said that if we fully embrace nature solutions for nature-based solutions for climate change, which focus on protecting and restoring our natural ecosystems, that this could get us 30% of the way towards our greenhouse um, gas or Paris emissions targets by 2030. So connecting people to nature now in this time of crisis will benefit our health directly right now and hopefully also in the future. So you can see from this slide, um, the director of the UN Environment Program has said that nature is one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and should be part of every country's climate strategy. And again, think to, thinking to the future, kids who have more nature experiences are more likely to become adult environmentalists. So we're setting us up for, for a good future. And so I just wanna briefly go over some different things that, I'm, that I've done, um, we've done with CAPE and also with the BC Parks Foundation in terms of getting people outside. So we've um, hosted sort of nature events where a doctor um, provides some information about uh, the health benefits of nature combined with a nature guide to give people that outdoor experience. Um, and then, so the thing is right now, like we obviously can't get people outdoors in big groups, you know, to connect socially together and also to nature. So um, what the BC uh, Parks Foundation did last weekend was they hosted this big at-home picnic. So where people could kind of celebrate nature either in their backyards or at home and recognize the beauty of our province, but also stay safe and connect with people. So this was a great event. We had um, about 500, over 500 people attend. And so it was, it was some pretty good uh, picnic vibes were going on there. Um, and then last but not least, we're planning um, to launch a parks prescription program with the BC Parks Foundation, where doctors and healthcare providers will actually be um, prescribing nature to people um, for the health effects. So keep an eye out for that. We plan to launch this, um, this spring, but with everything happening, obviously that's not gonna happen. So just keep an eye out. And I just wanna mention, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Let's see. Stop share. Okay. Um, okay. So the second idea I want to mention is sort of what Yasin talked about also. So around um, connecting virtually. Um, so. So a lot of industries we've seen during this time have become pretty flexible um, around and creative with figuring out how to let their executives and their employees work and meet remotely. And, and we've already seen a huge drop in pollution over our urban areas of result, as a result. So I think we can also um, amplify, safely amplify the message that we can and should replace travel for work and conferences with virtual connecting as much as possible, um, using the data that we've seen on carbon and pollution levels during this crisis, again, down the road. Um, I think it provides some pretty compelling data about, you know, what we can do. And honestly, I think, I think this is a message that a lot of people across the political spectrum would be in favor of. Um, I hear a lot of people, they want to work virtually and they want to work um, from home more. So uh, anyway, I think this is something that we keep it, keep in mind. And I am done my part. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm going to flip. Uh, I, we're, I, we are seeing um, like con some concern uh, in the chat 
um, from folks who are saying parks are closed. How can people get outside with their families? Um, so I will leave you to think about that while we flip to Courtney and then maybe when we get back to questions, you can respond to that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Perfect. Courtney. Oh, hi everybody. Um, this is my daughter, Vivi. She's been putting up with me and her dad being at the hospital a lot. So uh, we're taking the opportunity to cuddle when we can. Um, so um, let me see if I can, I guess, get rid of this chat here. So we've been using the word planetary health. Can you see my slides? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we've been using the word planetary health a lot and it's a bit of a new term. So we'll go through that a little bit. So just to give people a sense of where I am, I uh, live in Yellowknife in the subarctic and my patient population extends all the way up to the high arctic. So this is a picture I took between um, Inuvik and Eklavik. So that part of the world is already three degrees Celsius warmer than it was at baseline. So this is something I care a lot, care about a lot. And um, our patients care about. So I think what we need to do right now is, is reframe health. And we're already starting to do that in the way that we talk about things. But this is a new way of thinking about things for both medical people and uh, other people. And so we'll just uh, think about it a little bit. So when uh, many of us went to school, or when I did anyway, I, I kind of thought that I was learning how to be a doctor because that was what you did if you wanted to take care of health. And I really thought that a tremendous amount of health was uh, created within healthcare institutions. And I think we had two presentations on the social determinants of health while I was at medical school, and that's it. And so since then, what we've realized is there's a lot of different things that affect our health. So this is something that me and my uh, grade seven uh, art skills uh, drew a couple months ago. And so when you think about it, the ecological determinants of health, things like climate, soil, water, food, fuel, um, really form almost a nest or underpinning. And if those are stable, um, they allow us to do things like create social structures and economic systems that then allow us to build roads and schools and universities um, to educate people. And if that's all going really well and we have a tremendous amount of concentrated resource and an organized society, that lets us build the really complex structure that is a hospital. And actually Trevor Hancock, who's on the line, and I um, did a review a couple of months ago to look to try to look at studies from around the world that tried to figure out what percentage of total overall health comes from healthcare, and there's quite a range. So some studies show as low as 5%, which was quite humbling. Some go up to 25%. So I decided to sort of like the, the median there, or like a fair estimate based on what we know seems to be that 20% of overall health comes from healthcare. So you can see that not only do the ecological determinants of health and the social determinants of health, which end up being things like housing, which people have mentioned, or your, your environment or your education have direct impacts on health, but all of that needs to be going well for us to even have a functioning healthcare system. And that's something that's really become clear as we've looked at the supply chains involved in supplying our hospitals through this crisis. So, you know, our PPE um, is running out in many parts of the country. And, and when you think about what is required for that to, to, to be working, you need, a, you need an adequate economy somewhere, you need open borders, you need the ability to, to get things places, you need money. And so all of those are, are in fact determinants of health that are required to strengthen our healthcare. So when we're talking about health as a society, um, this is a planetary health frame. And so when you're thinking about these stimulus packages that, that we're hearing about, um, it's really important from my point of view, um, you know, we know that Canadians uh, care about health more than almost anything else. And sometimes we use the word health care for that instead of the word health. And I think it's really important. We're very precise with our language because they're not the same thing. Um, but I've shown these slides now to, and I'd appreciate people not uh, tweet them out because I'm publishing a version of these soon. Um, but we, we need to be pretty specific about the way we talk about it and recognize that any policy that we put forward that improves things like housing or improves, you know, aspects of the climate is actually contributing to health. And so I just want to really recognize something that, you know, Melissa has been talking about, and that's just the mental health place that we're in right now. So I've done a lot of work on ecological grief and eco anxiety. And we know that, you know, there's a huge uptick um, worldwide in those feelings. So the grief felt as a result of, you know, current or anticipated change in the world. And so I think that um, what we're at an interesting point right now, because people are still feeling this, but meanwhile, there's an entirely different anxiety around COVID. And uh, anxiety leads to a lot of different feelings in people. So there's a physiologic response, there's the, the desire to 
do something about it. There's different ways of coping and making a plan definitely alleviates anxiety. So what we need to do right now is make a plan that takes into account all of these different worries that people are feeling because that will help us a feel better and do better and make, you know, a, a world that uh, we can step into with confidence. And so as a climate community, I think it's pretty important that we take a good look at how people are feeling and how, how, what we hope people do, because the emotions that we elicit with the stories that we present um, are a real determinant of action. And so this is a slide from Marshall Gann. So he talks about action inhibitors and action motivators. So um, he says that urgency, a sense of urgency can overcome inertia, anger can overcome apathy, hope can overcome fear, solidarity can overcome isolation, and a feeling of you can make a difference. So examples of uh, positive change can overcome feelings of self-doubt. And so when I look at those and I think about the situation we were in prior to COVID and compare it to now, I think that our narratives will be most helpful if we take into account a really deeply changed societal emotional situation. So what I'm seeing in the emergency department right now, so I just, I'm on shift five of six and I just worked overnight, I'd say 75% of the presentations had something to do with anxiety. So we had, um, you know, we, we went from one patient with COVID to four and then WT over the overnight and one of them actually came in while I was working and the stress level in the hospital is super, super high. So we're lucky. We live 1,500 kilometers north of Edmonton. So we've had a lot longer than most jurisdictions in Canada to revamp our system. So I would say we have never been more prepared for anything. We've been essentially redone the entire medical system here. And so we're all waiting there with our properly applied PPE, but there's three administrators hovering and all CBC North was talking about this morning was this. And so people are feeling this in actual symptoms of anxiety, but it's lodging in people's bodies in a really big way. So I've seen tension headaches. I've seen stomach aches. I've seen actually new neurological presentations. So I think as communicators and people who are speaking to a, you know, a large audience, I, I'd say we, we don't really need to be working with like urgency is, is, is not an emotion I think we need to like create nearly as much as before. People are no longer in that state of inertia. They are, they're here, they're, they're scared. Um, I don't really know that we need more anger. We just broke the table. <laughs> happened yesterday. <laughs> happened yesterday. Um, what I think we need, the emotions we could usefully emphasize right now are hope, um, solidarity and a really strong feeling of you can make a difference. So when we're, when we're speaking, um, I think we want to be talking about the path to safety. So what we were emphasizing before is this, your world is on fire, be alarmed. Now I think what we want to emphasize is we are alarmed. Here's where safety lies. And this is the, the string of policies that will improve our health on all of these different determinants of health levels and get you to a place where you simply feel better about the world we're inheriting because you know looking forward to the summer unless this summer is very different than other summers we're going to have a bunch of wildfires we're going to have heat events we're going to have floods in the spring so we want to be giving the message look like with these economic stimulus packages we want to be solving two problems at the same time and moving forward to a place where we're taking all of these different crises into account building our resilience to them and decreasing their risk of uh, happening in the future so the bucket analogy, there's a, a book called Can You Fill a Bucket Today that I've, we've read, right? Can you fill a bunch of times, she says. We've read this book a bunch of times. And it's a pretty useful, easy way to be talking about people's emotional energy. So the idea is that the water inside the bucket is, <laughs> my daughter's asking me to hold up the table. <laughs> there's a uh, bunch of basically the amount of energy you have is represented by the water in the bucket. And you can either be a bucket dipper or be in a, society, a situation that's removing energy from your bucket, or you can be in a situation that's replenishing your bucket. So the things that uh, Melissa has been talking about in terms of going into nature, the information that public health officials are giving us to keep us briefed, I think also put energy in our bucket. Things like uncertainty, uh, financial worries, our sense of, of loss of place or role in the world to do with economics, inefficiencies in, um, you know, uh, this, I, I wrote that at my last, uh, before our last webinar and everything we were doing at the hospital was super inefficient because we're halfway through changing processes and it was actually really frustrating. I think we're a little beyond that. 
but we're going to be moving more into a space of bereavement as as a as a country we need to be really respectful of that so i think that the more we can be putting energy into people's buckets with our actions and giving them the energy that they need to to not only cope with their immediate situation, but give direction to policymakers the better. And I think that means presenting a lot of solutions um, and presenting them as a frame to safety. So I really like uh, the concept of planetary health. Um, I am, full disclosure, I'm on the steering committee of the Planetary Health Alliance and I'm quite involved with this movement, but the definition is useful. So the health of human civilization and the natural systems upon which it depends. So it makes that diagram really clear in one sentence. And so some of the key messages I think these days are, you know, in 2020, health is planetary. So we are all in this together. Um, lives are saved when we listen to experts and act within critical time windows. Inequality is bad for everyone's health. We see what's happening in the U.S. Like, I am so deeply grateful for Yasin and the other people in our public health system. We are so lucky. Um, a safe and healthy future can be created through initiatives that optimize the determinants of health as well as health systems. And when we act quickly, we can change the world quickly. So, you know, I think we all feel as though we're at we're on the cusp of a new world. And it's a challenge because we're all coping with our immediate situation and challenges at the same time as there's this moment in time where we need to quickly and very uh, directly influence uh, government decisions within a very narrow time window. And it's quite a balance we need to play. So I thank you for being here with us. And uh, I know that uh, everybody has different things to offer to the situation and questions. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing people's comments and answering questions. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, mm -hmm. And thanks, thanks, Vivi, for uh, hanging out with us. Um, just to also um, briefly say, I think that there, we're also hearing um, in, in, as Courtney said, some of the ways that we can respond to this crisis can also be really valuable for like really um really relate to ways we can improve health for everybody going forward one of the things courtney had said um when we were pushing back against the idea that um fossil fuels might fossil fuel companies might get a really large bailout was like you don't we can't solve the current crisis by um investing in the things that will cause the next health crisis um and dermid campbell lendrum who's the lead researcher for the environment sector of the WHO said, if COVID-19 is a sprint to save lives, climate change is the marathon. So it's this challenging time when we're, I think, um, rightly not leading with messaging about climate change because people are filled with so much stress and anxiety about the current crisis, but that climate change actually offers some of those hopeful, um, those hopeful things and those hopeful solutions in that if we use this experience later to reduce air pollution that actually might make people's lungs healthier for further for the next time we see um, a respiratory illness um, that um, if we if we do invest in planting trees there will be more nature close by us so uh, we will be getting the benefits daily um, so i think all of us are starting to think about how do we how do we come out of this in a way that the world is better and more, more resilient um, for more people? Um, so the, I wanna go back um, to um, the question that we had, had got about, um, so like one, parks are closed, so do you have suggestions for where people can get out in nature that aren't parks? Two, a concern that as summer comes, there might be too many people in parks and how do we sort of navigate that? Um, and three, um, it was a question, but it's a flag. I think we want to be really clear that when we're saying get into nature, we don't mean like go to a remote community that has limited health services. We mean find something with, within your, um, probably within driving distance and then return to your own home. Like do not, do not go to remote communities. Um, but back on the back, Melissa, to you on on sort of park access during this time. Sure. So I, I think um, during kind of that second last week of, of March, 
here in BC anyway, we, we source, saw sort of like a gradual closing in of, of what we had available to us to, to, to do in terms of nature. So, you know, I planned a camping trip to Oregon over spring break with my family, um, but that obviously, you know, we kind of nixed that maybe a couple of weeks before, um, before that. And then we decided to go to Tofino. And then the morning we were due to leave, the Tofino mayor said, don't come, um, which is total, you know, of course, you know, makes a lot of sense, especially based on what you said. So, and then, you know, for, so we said, okay, well, maybe we'll, we'll go on a whole bunch of, you know, a series of day hikes around the lower mainland. And so we, we did, we started going to beautiful provincial parks we have near us. We're pretty lucky um, out here in, in BC. And then kind of halfway through the week, um, all the provincial parks closed. So, so I agree that we've seen kind of like a narrowing of, of the options that we have, um, available for nature but the thing about our cities is we still so the parks are closed like the the kind of amenities are closed like someone mentioned the dog parks and the playgrounds but i believe most municipal parks are open for people to still walk through um and to still kind of you know walk um walk on the trails even if they're not you know sitting around or you know playing games or, or whatever so um, I think one thing that we have to keep in mind when we do that is is try not to go during peak hours. So one of the reasons why some of these park closures happened in part was due to us. So people thought, oh, there's not a lot of recreation time, you know, not a lot of things we can do. So we're going to, you know, pour into our provincial parks and, and our um, national parks over spring break. And that, unfortunately, we saw crowding. And so the government, in, in part, chose to close them for that reason. So we have to be, we have to be careful um, in terms of what we do. And someone else brought up a point about urban nature and how um, it's important for us to access it locally and also to focus on increasing green space within cities. And I totally agree during times like this, when we can't move freely, it's so important for us to have trees outside our windows. It's so important for us to have local green space to go to, you know, when, when we can't go further. So I think, I think it's an overall strategy, um, both kind of in, improve and increase protected areas and then also increase nature within our cities. But we have to, when we get that message out, it has to be in a way that's safe. So, you know, avoiding peak times, choose less popular parks, don't go remote. Um, so it's not just like head outside and enjoy yourself. It's head outside, be smart at this time and think about your neighbors. Thanks, Yasin. Did you want to add something? Yeah, and maybe just to add something, because the these all of the measures that are currently put, being put in place by public health departments and by governments, all of them have uh, important aspects of restricting freedoms and things like that, and they're all subject to questions of uh, of ethics. Uh, are we doing more harm than good? And I think that the parks illustrate that very well. Um, for example there there's been discussions in some of the urban areas here of completely closing the parks and the reason those discussions are happening is because we're getting more and more uh gatherings happening in those parks which basically represent a good opportunity for transmission as a gathering anywhere else uh i think that we're we're basically treading a fine line of how much we restrict things uh, without causing harm, and I think that's that's something that the the climate change community is very well versed into, kind of doing those those cons taking on those considerations and balancing things out. Uh, because when we talk about climate action, there's also issues of equity around the world. Certain places where restricting access to energy would have greater impacts than climate change ever would, uh, and we have to kind of apply similar logic to that. And I think that. All of the interventions are, are being uh, challenged by many people whenever they're being put into place. That that's a safe thing, and I think it's also important to sometimes keep challenging interventions that are put in place by governments when uh, when it seems that uh, they could have negative impacts on health. Uh, the park closures, I think that, like you're saying, there are safe ways of using the parks. Uh, walking through them and things like that but if they actually get a red, yellow ribbon around of the all of them well everyone kind of loses on that and has to now walk on the on the concrete maybe around the park again but on the concrete but yeah thanks are there um if you've got i think that that was a lot of the questions were in relation to that um if folks on the call have questions and you want to drop them in the chat that's how that's how we're getting them. Let me just check. Uh, um, oh, uh, a question to Courtney. Do you have, um, have you done a TED talk on, on planetary health? 
Yes, it's called Healthy People, Healthy Planet. Um, and I just wanted to mention, somebody had pointed out that uh, it looks like everything's connected. And I didn't adequately explain this time that it is connected. So people are saying, you know, you can't care about the environment because of the coronavirus. But essentially, when you're looking at it from a planetary health or a one health frame, the coronavirus made its leap into humans as a result of a poorly monitored uh, interface between humans and the rest of the natural world. And whether, you know, it's habitat destruction or climate change, a lot of other environmental factors are going to make that type of interaction more likely. So in fact, coronavirus is an example of exactly why we need to be paying attention to the interface between humans and the natural world. So it's, it's not a reason not to act on climate change. It is actually a reason to act on climate change. And it's important that we deliver that message and help explain that. Thanks. Um, ideas on how to support continuous funding for healthcare and green healthcare and green infrastructure at the end of when, when we are getting to the other side of this or things we can be thinking about now so we're ready on the other side of this. Robin, or sorry, Court, I was going to say, Robin, I know you've also been talking to people about green healthcare, but Courtney, do you want to jump in? Um, yeah, sorry, I was trying to type while you were talking, but I think just on in terms of green healthcare, there are a lot of initiatives going on right now in Canada around green healthcare. So I'm a board member of the Canadian Medical Association, and we did get climate change and health onto the strategic plan of the CMA, which is kind of a big deal right now because uh, they actually have a lot of resources. So right now, the CMA is very much focused on um, COVID appropriately, but there's still a significant amount of their staff that is moving forward on the climate change and health work. And so I think they will be also moving to a more planetary health style approach. Something that, um, you know, I'm increasingly thinking about from a mental health standpoint is actually the mental health of practitioners themselves. So, you know, coming out of some of these other uh, countries, um, I think that uh, part of this has to do with paying attention to the global consequences. You know, in India, they just don't have the resources we have in, in other, even in the U.S. And so part of planetary health is a global health, solidarity, humanitarian mindset. And so as we're thinking about that in Canada and inequities here within Canada in terms of Indigenous populations, et cetera, I think we need to really be also doing what we can as Canadians to advocate for help um, in other countries. Thanks. Um, sorry. I saw one question about how, what are messages of hope in this time of planetary existential crisis? And I think um, I saw some of them in the chat um, that people were sharing, actually. I think we've seen this incredible way that people are really showing up for each other, um, reaching out to their neighbors, forming online communities where people, uh, um, someone, there's a two group, there's groups of like, cities where they're um so it's like covid care vancouver um and someone will say i have a need i i um can't get groceries or i just lost my job or i am being kicked, evicted by my landlord though that's not happening anymore and hundreds of people respond with support for how to manage in this time and i think so i think in a way the hopeful thing i see is that we're learning to reconnect in community local communities and really really having to care for each other um, and I also think we are practicing what it means to respond collectively to a crisis in a way that will prepare us to continue to respond collectively to act on climate change. Um, I, I wondered if other folks wanted to add. Yeah, I think we're building resilience and skill and those community ties that are what is going to keep us safe. And I think we have a new sense of what crisis looks like. So we're never again, no one alive right now um, is ever again going to be in that state of complacency of the, it can't happen to us. You know, I'm hearing people talking about supply chains. I've been worrying about supply chains since I worked in Djibouti and we did run out of some medical supplies and now everybody's talking about supply chains. So that, that's good. Um, and I think that uh, we're building some of the resilience we're going to need and some of the heightened level of awareness. So, you know, we're seeing how much better, like, can you, Canada's public health system is being celebrated. And I think people are understanding how important that is. So this sort of 
the importance of resourcing uh, centrally and listening to experts. I think people are feeling that. You know, we're seeing these t-shirts with public health officers uh, photos on them and stuff. I think that's all super, super healthy. So I think we're going to see some really good work coming out of this. And we just need to keep emphasizing, like use this time of reflection to create that vision and get really good at articulating it in a way that we can put now before policymakers because we need to. And as people have the bandwidth coming out of COVID, we can put before the population more generally to create a real sense of hope because, you know, you don't get to pick when emergencies happen. And often two sick patients come into the emergency room at the exact same time. And the best situation is if you give orders to part of your team to take care of one, well, you go see the worst person, the most acute person. And then when you're done with that person, you emerge and you go check on the first person and they're already half better. You're like, great. And it's the, the opposite is the worst. If you put somebody in a corner and everybody gets diverted and you come out and that person's sicker, um, you know, we need to really make clear to people how much better it's going to feel if we solve both problems simultaneously, because then we'll, we'll emerge into summer, into fall. We'll be like, hey, look, we're in a new place. This is amazing. And just talk about how, how good that will feel to have co-solved these problems together because we can. And um, one thing I want to mention in terms of solving these problems together is just something I've observed as a doctor. So uh, it, it really seems like people get confused or upset or frustrated when they when we don't have a consistent and centralized message. So I think, for example, like different provinces um, are giving different messages to frontline workers about the need to wear masks or other PPE. And this is making a lot of people anxious when they're hearing different messages from different people. So I think in the future, if climate and health organizations can somehow connect to decide on and push out the same message at the same time, while individually customizing it in a way that sounds truthful and makes sense for us individually, I think this could be a really effective way to mobilize the public and, and gain their trust. Thanks. We're so we're at time. I want to, yes, and I want to give you one more chance to say something. Um, and also, Courtney and Melissa, if you've got like final last thoughts before we close out, um, you could do that as well. Maybe as last thoughts, I think that. Canada has responded relatively early and very well. So I think we're in a good situation compared to many other places in the world. And we have to be hopeful and try to do our best to, to, uh, to continue doing what we've been doing, um, meeting up over Zoom instead of in person, and uh, still hanging out with the people that we care about virtually instead of uh, live, but maintaining those social connections and strengthening those, the, the the, the society that we live in. And uh, I think that if models are correct with a kind of a very, very big caveat, the peak is likely to come soon in, in, in Canada, probably with the next two-ish weeks, uh, with the peak of cases next week maybe, and the peak of hospitalization and so on the week after. That still leaves half of the people that are gonna be sick after the peak, right? The peak is somewhere in the middle. Um, and then, uh, hopefully things will get a bit better and things will be a bit easier later on. Uh, with the caveat that we're not sure how many of the measures that we're currently in place will be able to to remove uh, rapidly because not everyone is going to be immune uh, at this point in time because we intervened earlier and hopefully saved lives. Okay, I think that's a really hopeful note to leave on. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you attendees, those of you for, for joining us today. Um, it, it was incredible. It's incredible to know how much interest there is in this and how many incredible people are connected and well-informed and wanna do more. Um, CAPE is working on developing a series of webinars, so we will keep you up to date on, uh, on what's to come. Um, but for now, thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your Friday.